first of all, I know everyone comes up here and uh, thanks the organization and thanks um, the people that made this possible for an opportunity like this, which is a great opportunity. But I personally want to thank my wife, Leslie, uh, first. Um, we all know we're nothing without having a strength behind us, and she's always been my strength for the last 27 years and will continue to be my strength and what drives me to, to try and get better. Um, I would like to thank the Toronto Blue Jays, Ross Atkins, Mark Shapiro, Gil Kim, uh, Charlie Wilson, who hired me in 2013, took a chance on a 42-year-old coach who'd never coached yet until he was 42. Um, so he took a chance on me, and I'll always be thankful for that, Charlie, that you took a chance on me, even though you didn't pay me anything that year. <laughs> um, <laughs> As you guys will find out, I, li I love to have a good time. Um, don't let the old face, big shoulders, you know, dissuade you from fun. It's, we win by leading by example. We win by making our players better. We win by making the clubhouse culture something that the players can drive on a daily basis. And myself and our entire staffs main job is to facilitate that culture and drive it in the right direction, but let the players have the lead. Uh, the Toronto Blue Jays have done a phenomenal job in the last three, four years since Mr. Shapiro came in and Ross of driving purposeful practice, driving individual development, and making sure each individual player in our system gets better. But in the process, sometimes that some gets left out. And in this case, it was, it was compete to win. Our players are getting better. We are developing extremely talented young baseball players that are getting to the big leagues. But now we're going to start implementing the compete to win process. And what that will mean is we will pay extra, extraordinary attention to each, into players, each player's individual plan to make them the best they can be. As soon as that is over with our BP in practice, that plan goes out the window, and our job is to go out and win. So our team motto this year is kind of be this kind of thing, are you ready? Are you ready to win the Governor's Cup is the first question I ask the team. And if you're not ready to win the Governor's Cup, then we're in the wrong place. So with that being said, I am so extremely humbled to be here in Buffalo. It's a great city with the historic history for baseball. I know coming here, getting played, you guys, and get my butt kicked as a player, and just being here over the last few years, it's a great city. So I'm extremely humbled to be here, extremely excited to get the season started, and ex I'm really, really excited to see where the future goes for this team and the group of kids coming in here. So with that, thank you guys very much for allowing me to be here this year. Thank you. Uh, any questions for me? Yeah, we'll take some questions now. Can, we, can you talk about the, the thought process of going from the third year and wanting to get back in the dugout after you? Um, yeah, um, the, this is such a great opportunity in Buffalo. Um, historically, in the past, coordinators, you know, is was the cream of the crop of the organization as far as running their each individual program, and I think it still is considered that. But there comes a time when you miss the field. I miss the field. I miss uh, the individual relationships with the players. And when this, when Bobby Meacham did a phenomenal job here for the time he was here, and when this job became available, I just thought it was that was my opportunity to try and get back on the field. Ken, how important is it for you, as you were saying earlier, to develop those relationships with players, to let them know you care about them as people? Because especially in the minor leagues, it's so easy to feel like you're getting lost in the shuffle and how much you want them to know they're important. It's, 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 the, it's everything that we have to do as a staff is develop those personal relationships. Uh, we live by a model. They don't care what you know until they know that you care. Um, I live by that when it came to the catchers. And right, it, we're, I'm fortunate because I got to Rove that I know a lot of the, you know, who, the potentially who could be here this year. Whoever Mike that is, I am so sorry. <laughs> Who's is that? Mine. Is it still working? Yes. All right. How'd that sound coming down? A little, little rough. Was it? Sorry about that. All right. Um, but I, I know a lot of these guys on a personal level uh, from roving around, but I don't know them. 
So that will be the challenge is to actually dive in. Um, they will have my trust right out of the shoot and respect. I have to earn theirs, and I know I have to do that. Ken, this team hasn't made the postseason since 2005. As somebody who's been around baseball as long as you have, what's the biggest difference between a team that comes up short and a team that makes it to the postseason? Defense and pitching. Um, and I know that's a challenge at this level because – we're typically looked at as a as a level that supports our major league team and trying to help our mission statement, which is bring the World Series back to Canada. Um, this team is in direct support of that. So my job is to create a culture that no matter who is here, that they're driving that we're trying to win the Governor's Cup, regardless of who's here. So the, the parts don't matter. It's the people that are here and the culture that the core group that will be here for most of the year are driving. I think that's the difference between just not making it, is are they trying? I didn't do that one. That's why he's not the catching. So I'm just going to hold it. All right, so um, will that be a blooper on you? I hope it's not. Not up to me. Okay. So, um, but it, it really is, honestly, culture and if, the, and if the players are driving it, whether you come up short or not. Because the reality of this level is the team we start with here on April 10th will not be the same team that will be here April 20th or April 30th or May 1st. It's not. And that's the reality of it. But you have guys that probably will be here most of the year, and they have to drive that culture. Catchers are, are known as the guys that kind of make that best seamless transition, if you will, from playing – to managing, what would you say might be your best attributes to give you this opportunity when you meet with these guys and, and to be a successful manager? Uh, I think my experience at this level as a player allows me to connect with them on a level of I've been through everything they've been through. So the question is not that you got sent down or that you did not make the major league team. It's how the best managers I played for wanted to know how they could help me get back to the major leagues and stay. And if, I think if, if the rest of the staff and myself can provide that kind of environment that, hey, listen, this is what we're going to do for you. We're going we're gonna to try and get you back to the major leagues where you belong and get you to stay. But in the meantime, while you're here and we're doing this work, can you do me the favor and let's win? And don't, and don't just shut down after the work is done. Let, let's, let's win some games. And, and if we all pull together and win some games, at the end of the season, everyone's numbers look really good. And if we don't, only one or two numbers will be good, and everyone else's will be not too good. So um, try and get that message across to our little bit more veteran guys. What lesson can you impart from your relationship with Roy Halladay to your players? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, from Roy, really taught you that different people have different ways of thinking and different ways of going about their business. And as a catcher, it's my job to figure out that I have – I have 13 of those guys that all have different ways they go about their business. Roy was a guy who was quiet. Roy was a guy who didn't talk very much. Unless you got him like on the lake fishing or got him really away from the field, he was a guy that was always on a mission. But then at the same time, you turn around and you have a guy um, like Mike Soraka, who was a little bit more out, outspoken. And so now you're kind of in a – I think that's what it taught me, was that each, each player – has their own identity and it's in it's our job and our team's job to find out what each identity is how do we live with each other in a cohesive nature even though we do have differences and make it work seamlessly as a guy who made a life in this game and your life was often to protect the signs what has this week been like for you to see what's going on uh it i mean i haven't really had the opportunity to really dig into it i've been up in uh, Petawawa, I think that's how you say it, for the Canadian Special Operations. So this is all broke since I've come down from that, so I really haven't had a chance to dive into it. I'm glad that it's been found out. I'm going to say that. And that discipline was taken for it. I am happy with that. But anything further than that, I really can speak intelligently to. What do you think about having a guy like Nate Pearson here this year? I mean, you know what it's like to have an ace, and it looks like that's an ace you're going to have. It could be. It could be. Like I said, uh, the players, it, it's tough. It's unfair for me to say uh, that I'm looking forward to having Nate Pearson here because 
I've already stated that my, our goal, I almost said my goal, but our goal is to get these guys to the big leagues. I hope Nate Pearson makes our starting rotation for Toronto by the end of spring training. But if he doesn't, then holy cow, yes. I'm fired up to have Nate Pearson on my staff if he doesn't make that team. And he's a special treat to watch. He's a specimen. He's humble. I think he's going to be a good leader in our clubhouse. And he will be fun for the people of Buffalo to watch for a while. Last season, there were three top prospects who were on the hitting side. Yes. As you look at who might be here this year, is the, are there those kind of prospects on the pitching side, or are there more hitters coming through? So what kind of team, I guess, are we looking at here? Uh, like, like I just I just meant it's hard to say because we won't know our team until Toronto takes off. Um, and then we don't start literally for 12 days later after they take off and play their first game. So our team could literally change before we even play our first game, and that's another one. So. <laughs> I hope you guys are enjoying this. Um, um, so we won't, know, we won't know our team until literally we show up here in Buffalo. And so... The potential of who we could have, we're going to have the potential of having some potentially really strong pitching is highly likely that we could have some really, really strong pitching. Uh, we've signed guys back like Kivlahan and Burns, um, you know, Santiago Espinal, a lot of these kids that are in our system. Um, but I think pitching, our, our pitching wave of prospects is the next thing coming through our system right now. I'm not, not to dismiss our prospects coming through as hitters, not at all. But um, when you're talking about guys like Vladdy and Bo and Biggio and Guriel, or you know, have potential to be elite players at the big league level, um, you're talking about Nate Pearson, TJ Zoik, and and, and those guys. You know, they have the potential to be elite players at the big league level, also.